harmony is an important principle in our practice. Both harmony inside and harmony outside. The Buddha extolled monks who live together in harmony. The description is those who look, in, look at one another with eyes of affection, who blend like milk and water. In other words, you put water into milk and you can't see where the water is as opposed to where the milk is. They blend immediately. And it's a situation like that, a society like that, where it's easiest to practice the Dharma. This is why a split in the Sangha, the Buddha said, is one of the five most heinous things you can do. Because once there's a split, then it's difficult for people to get along, it's difficult for them to practice. Everyone spends their time talking about the issues and taking sides. And as a result, there's very little time for meditating. And even if it doesn't get to the level of a full split, just the fact that there are factions or there are long-standing disagreements and grudges, it gets difficult to sit down and meditate in peace. Here in the West we have the idea that sort of a romantic hero who stands up against the evils of society. We take on corruption and a situation like that, the ability not to get along is prized. But when you've got a society that's based on wanting to practice the Dharma, having a set of common goals, it's the other way around. Getting along is a good thing. You're not being asked to do anything immoral. You're not being asked to do anything against your principles. Most of the conflicts come down to simply matters of personality. preferences, which are really not worth fighting over. You want to protect your time to meditate, and you want to protect other people's time to meditate as well. And this is why harmony outside is important, because it also helps induce harmony within. The two principles help one another along. So it's good to reflect on the way you're getting along with everyone else, to see how it helps or hinders your ability to get along with yourself. They would have talked about four, four ways of inducing harmony. And in direct terms, he was talking about harmony outside, but you can also apply it inside. The four are generosity, kind words, genuine help, and consistency. Generosity doesn't necessarily always mean being generous with things. It means being generous with your opinions, generous with your forgiveness. That's extremely important. Generosity with things is limited. You have only so many things to share. Especially as we live here in the monastery, we don't have that much around. And so you have to be choosy in who you give to, where you feel, feel most inspired to give, where you feel it will be put to the best use. That's the basic principle. But in terms of forgiveness, knowledge, these are things that you can give without stint. It lightens your own mind, it lightens the situation all around you. Forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean you have to like the other person, simply that you're not going to pose a danger to the other person. You're not going to try to get revenge, you're not going to try to get retaliation. Whatever wrong they've done, you're not going to try to play karma cop and make sure that they get punished right away. In terms of your knowledge, you share your knowledge in a way that's not overbearing. That generally is helpful. We'll talk about that in a minute. And in general principle, we're realizing here we live in the monastery, there's work to be done. Certain jobs the monks can do, certain jobs the monks can't do. So whatever way you can be of help, this is, a, this is a part of the practice. Sometimes we feel that the genuine practice is when you're sitting with your eyes closed meditating, but that's only one part. I remember reading a while back a, a book by a woman who had been 
doing a comparative study of a Thai temple and, uh, and an Anglo meditation center. And one of the first things she picked up on was the concept of practice in the Anglo meditation center was much more restrictive. In the Thai temple, everything counted as practice, generosity, virtue, meditation, or in other terms, virtue, concentration, and discernment, all the things that develop good qualities in the mind. That was considered practice, whereas in the Anglo center it was just sitting and walking mindfully. That was it. And the author recounts how one night she was talking to one of the members of the Anglo Center, and it suddenly hit that person that you know, traditional Buddhists have a much larger view of practice, that the fact that they come and they present food to the monks, that could actually be part of their practice. For her, it was a real revelation. For us here, it should be a fact of life. We do our best to help one another along. Whatever needs to be done, whatever way you can develop generosity of heart, that's a part of the practice. If you can't be generous in little things like this, how are you going to give up your defilements? Those are much more tightly held in the mind. So generosity is a basis for the practice. In Thailand, when they teach little kids about Buddhism, the first thing that little kids will learn would be how to raise their hands in respect, how to put, and then how to put rice in a monk's bowl. In other words, one, how to show respect, two, how to be generous. And in the beginning it may seem mechanical, but after a while the, the child learns to enjoy it. It feels good to show respect to people worthy of respect. It feels good to be generous. It puts the mind in a much more open state. When you're generous, you're conveying to yourself the idea that you have more than enough. When you're stingy, the message you keep sending yourself is, there's not enough, there's not enough. And which mind state is more likely to settle down in a state of ease, a state of concentration that's healthy and open? And which mind state is more likely to create a sense of harmony? second principle is kind words. When you speak to somebody, what energy is contained in your words? What impact is it going to have on that other person? You've got to think about this. Again, you want to have respect for your concentration, respect for the other person's concentration. So you try to say things, even if they are difficult things, things that the other person may not want to hear, you learn to say them in a way that's not going to be harmful and that's not going to hurt them. You look for the right time, you choose the right words to say, keeping the other person's feelings in mind. Because again, the more you disturb other people, the more your own concentration is going to be disturbed. And so the fact even when you have to disagree about things or you have to criticize someone about his or her behavior. The fact that you do it in a respectful way, in a kind way, it's going to make all the difference in the world as to whether they're going to be receptive to what you have to say or not. The third principle is genuine help. In other words, when you help someone else, you don't do it simply for the show or simply to show off or to prove your superiority. You look at what they, that person needs. If you can provide that need, then you provide it. That kind of help goes straight to the heart. The satisfaction that comes out of it has nothing to do with self-image, it's more that you, know, you really were able to provide help that that person needed. And the other person will appreciate it more. Because it shows on the one hand that you really are paying attention to the other person's needs, and that the help you're giving is not simply to make yourself feel good. It's not hypocritical. It's genuine desire to help. And that creates the kind of harmony that can withstand the, the fact that we are, are to have disagreements in the course of a day. 
if you've been of genuine help to the other person, it's a lot easier to get over disagreements, to iron them out, to actually deal not only in forgiveness, but also in reconciliation when things have gotten difficult. In other words, you've restored the friendship rather than simply telling yourself, as in the case of forgiveness, well, I'm just not going to pose a danger to that person. Reconciliation means you restore trust, and trust gets restored when you are genuinely helpful. The fourth principle is consistency. If you've helped somebody in the past, you continue helping them. That's one kind of consistency. The other kind of consistency is the way you speak about a person to his face is the same way you speak behind his back. So when you have these four principles in a society, the society lives in harmony, lives in peace. <coughs> Same principles also apply inside. Generosity inside. You're willing to give up your defilements. You're willing to give up any views that stand in the way of doing something skillful. And you try to create that spacious sense in your heart. And people who are really, really anxious, really greedy for success in the meditation, that often gets in the way. This is not to say that you can be, you should be complacent or lazy. You, know, you do the practice, but instead of being greedy for results, you say, well, I've got to focus on the causes. It means giving up, giving up certain comforts. You give more of yourself to the practice. A lot of people are very stingy when they meditate. They want to put in a little time and get a lot of results. But if you're generous in your meditation, you're willing to give whatever has to be given. If it's going to involve the pain of sitting for long periods of time, well, you're willing to give it. If you find yourself suffering because of some deeply held notions, well, you're willing to give them up. At least give it a try to give them up. And that way generosity, an inner generosity, an inner largeness of spirit is what helps the meditation get genuine results. Kind words, kind words for yourself. It's a famous story where John Cow was one of John Munn's early students, who tended to have a very strong and quick temper, got upset at his mind one night because it wasn't settling down. He started cursing his mind. And John Munn sensed this, and the next morning said, Look, don't do that to your mind. Don't curse your mind. It creates a really bad feeling inside. Okay, when you, the mind is obstreperous and when it's not settling down, do your best to urge it into concentration in a way where it's willing to settle down. Don't set up this inner voice of sarcasm or an inner voice of putting yourself down, because that's destructive in the practice. Learn to speak in ways that are encouraging. Look for whatever scrap of progress you have and focus on that. Say, look, I can do this. And if there are ways that you have been unskillful, well, learn to speak to yourself. Learn to train yourself in a way that actually has an effect, that you are willing to listen. So it doesn't add to depression or it doesn't add to a low sense of self-esteem, because those things really do get in the way of the practice. Learn to speak an encouraging word to yourself. When things get tough, reflect on the what they call the recollection of the Sangha. We've got the stories of the, the monks and the nuns who went through all kinds of hardships. You know, one monk talks about meditating for I don't know how many years decades and not having a moment of stillness, he said, and had he kept at it and finally was able to get his mind to settle down. So just because you're going through a bad period right now doesn't mean that you're hopeless. People have been in situations more hopeless than yours, and yet they've been able to pull out of it. They can do it. You can do it, too. Just learn how to think in these ways. In this way, your kind words to yourself. Even when you have to 
tell yourself unwelcome truths. Learn how to do it in a way that's effective. It's not just putting yourself down. It's instructive that in the Buddha's teachings to Rahula, when he's talking to Rahula about looking at his mistakes, he says, you know, be it learn how to restrain yourself. When you're looking at mental states that are unskillful, he says, have a sense of shame about that state. Not about yourself. Don't think of yourself as a shameful person for thinking those thoughts. Everybody thinks unskillful thoughts, except for the Arahants. Learn to see the thought as something you would be ashamed of following through with. Don't think of yourself as a shameful person. Learn how to make that distinction. It's important. Criticize the act, not the person. When you make distinctions like this, it's a lot easier to get through the dry periods of your meditation that are inevitable. And give yourself the encouragement that you need. Genuine help. This is what seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths are all about. Look at what you're doing that's causing stress to yourself and to the people around you. Focus on that instead of getting involved in all sorts of issues about what sort of person you are. Again, focus on where the genuine problem is in solving the genuine problem. There's something you're doing right now that's causing stress. Can you see it? Can you stop it? If you focus on this issue, then all the other issues get, get sorted out. It's one of the basic principles of any lessons in problem solving, is try to see where the genuine causes of the problem are and focus on those, and don't get distracted by extraneous things. Get the mind to settle down so you can see where craving is, because that's the problem. As long as there's going to be craving, well, you focus the craving on the path. What you can do to observe your precepts, what you can do to get the mind concentrated, what you can do to start analyzing what's going on in the mind. Focus your desire, focus your craving there. That way you'll be able to sort out what kind of craving is skillful and what kind of craving is not. If it pulls you off the path, okay, that's something unskillful. You've got to watch out for that. That means you've learned to sort out where the problem is, where the problem isn't. The Buddha didn't say that all desire is a cause of suffering. It's the specific types of desire. The desire to get the mind concentrated, the desire to give rise to insight, the desire for liberation, those are all part of the path. When you've got the path to measure things against inside the mind, then you can see where the genuine problem is, and that way you can focus your efforts on solving the genuine problem at the genuine cause. And then consistency. Okay, you've made up your mind, you want to practice, well, see it all the way through. Don't just take a little stab at it and say, well, gee, this is hard, I don't know about this. Or it looks like I can't do it. That kind of defeatist thinking. Never got anybody anywhere. Sit down and ask yourself what's really important in life. And you realize there are a lot of things that are not important. Well, don't indulge in those. Be consistent in pursuing what you really see as the goal that you want to pursue. That lesson I talk about with a woman playing chess. Decide that there's one thing in life you want more than anything else, and then pursue that and be willing to sacrifice everything else for that one thing. Now you get some people who follow that principle and they can wreak a lot of havoc in life. But this is a principle here that the desire for true happiness it causes no one any harm. That's a goal worth pursuing. The Pursuing, the Buddha said, this is the noble search. If you search for things, happiness and things that age, grow ill, and die, that's not a noble search, because it doesn't take you anywhere that, where you haven't already been. You're in the midst of aging, illness, and death yourself. 
But if you search for something that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die, that's a noble search because it takes you to a place where you're not causing anyone any harm. The mind is no longer its enemy, its own enemy. Everything's working together inside. That's what's meant by inner harmony. Because you find ultimately it's the mind that's the big troublemaker in life. It goes around laying claim to this, laying claim to that, getting upset when the things that it lays claim to doesn't give us the satisfaction at once, and then it goes all out of control. Blaming this person, blaming that person, the lack of harmony inside leads to lack of harmony outside. And you don't need to read too much world history to realize what can happen when people's own inner problems get played out on the world stage. But if you can learn to follow these practices that lead to harmony both inside and harmony outside, the happiness that develops is something that doesn't give you any cause for regret in any way. It's not disappointing in any way. So learn to value harmony inside and harmony outside as an important part of the practice.